Hi everyone. So I'm Brent and this is Naveed and today we're going to be presenting to you our color changing meta service for display and customizability applications. So just to kind of give you a brief overview of what drove us to do this project. One of the problems that a lot of modern cell phones have and a lot of mobile devices in general is that when you go outside they have very poor daylight contrast. When you're out in the sun all of the colors get washed out. Also, we wanted to be able to produce a device that would be able to allow users to change colors of any of their personal belongings at will for either cosmetic or for informative reasons. Now, the reason that we can't really do that already is because display technologies as they are, are not, it's not feasible to scale down a display technology just so your phone can change color. They use a lot of power and they have energy inefficient backlights if you're using LCDs and also they in general just have very complicated and costly manufacturing methods. We want to simplify that. So what can we do? We kind of quantified these customer requirements into four. How can we produce a good color change? Can our device be energy efficient? How quickly can the colors change? And how scalable is it for large, uh, large scale manufacturing? So, we proposed this. Our device is essentially a grading of plasmonic nanostructures when, uh, with a layer of liquid crystal. And when we change the liquid crystal orientation, we can produce a color change. Now we're going to briefly go into how this works. Naveed? So, it's already been shown in the literature that um, plasmonic structures of the order of um, the visible wavelength can absorb light at very spe specific frequencies. Um, this means uh, that we can, and, and, and this is very dependent on the refractive index, index of the surrounding medium. The dependency on the refractive index can be shown in this diagram when you have uh, different uh, um, dimensions of these uh, plasmonic structures at different uh, refractive indices. Uh, you get different reflective colors. Um, so one way to, so the key point here is that change in refractive index um, in this structure is, is, tra is translated into change in color. One way to change the refractive index is using liquid crystals. Uh, liquid crystals, uh, depending on their orientation, they have uh, different refractive indices. And uh, we investigated two methods uh, through which we, ca we could uh, change the orientation of the liquid crystal. One was surface switching and the other was field switching. Um, so, which I'll talk about those methods later. Uh, plasmonic grading uh, with metallic back reflector uh, act as a band stop filter. So what, what happens is when light comes in, comes in, the plasmonic structures absorb light at specific frequencies um, and the rest are reflected back. And you can see the dependency of the refractive index of the uh, surrounding medium. You can see the change, small changes in the refractive, refractive index uh, shifts the resonant dip and therefore the reflected color. So the absorption, as I said, is due to surface plasmon, localized surface plasmon resonance. Uh, what this means is that when, uh, when, uh, when you shine light on the structure, um, some, of, some of the energy at specific frequencies um, uh, transmit energy to the uh, collective uh, oscillation of the surface electrons on the surface of the gold and therefore get absorbed. And the rest are reflected back, possessing um, structural color. Um, uh, computer simulations show that uh, electrically mag magnetic fields of the incident light are concentrated on the top surface of the gold and therefore, because they're on the top surface, they, uh, there will be um, significant sensitivity to the refractive index of the surrounding medium. As I said, uh, by changing the orientation of liquid crystal, uh, because they possess uh, ordinary and extraordinary refractive indices, we can change the orientation of the liquid crystal and uh, achieve different refractive indices. For example, when there are when there are these uh, elongated molecules molecules are uh, perpendicular to the uh, incident uh, plane, we get a certain refractive index, and when they're parallel, we get a different refractive index. Um, and therefore, this is the method uh, by which we can change the color. Uh, first, as I mentioned, uh, we experienced with field switching. This method involves attaching uh, um, certain thiol molecules to the surface of the gold and then um, applying a small voltage to the gold. This, uh, what happens is that these molecules go through um, a redox reaction, they gain a charge, and through electrostatic propulsion, they stand upright perpendicular to the gold. And the change of the, this boundary condition forces the liquid crystal to um, reorient itself and therefore change the refractive index. We tried this method, we weren't very successful with it, so we moved on to the field switching method. This method involves having two plates. 
Um, uh, this is the gold that we had, the substrate, and this is a transparent uh, ITO glass um, surface. Uh, applying a voltage to, this, to these plates uh, creates a, an electric field between the two. And when the, when, when the electric field is off, the uh, liquid crystal orients itself according to the, surf, uh, to the boundary conditions. And when you apply a voltage, um, the electric field causes the liquid crystal to reorient. They want to minimize the energy and therefore they reorient themselves. And therefore, we can uh, achieve a change in refractive index and um, ultimately a change in color. So we started by doing some optical simulations to understand if this method is even feasible. And then after we got some uh, promising results and we found some uh, dimensions that we can work with, uh, we fabricated a device, uh, we verified our substrate, and uh, finally characterized our prototype. So um, the computer simulations were done uh, through, the through the rigorous coupled wave analysis on a commercial software called RSoft. Um, what you see here are re reflections color, reflected color simulations from two different geometries. Um, on top, you're using um, square uh, plasmonic gratings, uh, and on the bottom, uh, they are cir circular. So we changed the, the periodicity of these grading, st uh, grading structures and also their widths. And each uh, cell that you see is divided into two colors is because uh, we did the simulation for refractive index of 1.5 and 1.7. So you can see that the change in color is actually apparent. Um, so the reason why we tried circular, uh, uh, circular structures and square structures was uh, to make sure which one's better. And we ultimately went with uh, circles for two main reasons. Uh, the fabrication of uh, circular structures is easier because you can just do it through um, spot exposure on E-beam and there's no need for high resolution to create the corners. And also, they showed better colors, although you probably can't see from the projector, but we uh, feel, felt like that these colors were more resonant. Uh, the fabrication process is um, quite straightforward. We uh, p uh, deposited aluminum and um, e-beam resist on a silicon substrate. We patterned the, the, the resist using um, e-beam lithog using e-beam lithography. We then uh, deposited a thin layer of titanium on, on the structure for a better adhesion of gold. And uh, finally, we, we sputtered gold on the, the structure. And then the liftoff procedure was uh, conducted. And finally, we uh, this is the prototype, and this is an top view SEM of the prototype. Uh, the, circle, the, the circles are um, the gold plasmonic ratings, and the, the black background is the aluminum back reflector. Um, the scale bar is one micron, so you can see that those structures are of the order of the visible wavelength. Um, for, uh, we, before we applied the liquid crystal, we wanted to make sure that the change in refractive index actually changes color in the experiment. So, so far, we've, we had only done simulations. This is now the experiment showing on different uh, periodicities and different uh, dimensions of those structures, we will get a change in color when you change the refractive index from 1.5 to 1.7. And the reason why we, we chose these numbers is because the liquid crystal we use, E7, has a refractive index range of uh, 1.5 to 1.7. So you can, if you compare the simulations with, uh, with, the, with the experiments, you can see, I mean, there's, there's a clear change in color, but the trends are visible. For example, at, um, at 325 uh, nanometers periodicity and 150 uh, width, you can see that the, the, the same color changes are, are, are there. Uh, we, we speculate that the change between the simulation and experiment is because of two main reasons. First, that in the simulation we're using true white light, whereas in the experiment our light source might not be truly white, so that changes the color a little. And also that in the simulation ultimately we're using parameters that might not be 100% realistic for our case. So just to briefly go over how we characterized our sample and what results we got. In order to figure out how this device went up against our customer requirements, we looked at the following things. We looked at the color change that it can produce. We observed its experimental colors versus how the colors should have been simulated. We looked at the hue versus the, the voltage that we apply to create the electric field. We also looked at the energy consumption data, how energy efficient is our device. And we also looked at the refresh rate. So first is color change. So as you can see here, the diagram to the left here shows an array of 12 of our pixels. Each pixel is 0.1 microns by 0.1 microns uh, and is made up of an array of, oh, sorry, sorry, 100 microns by 100 microns and is made up of an array of these nanostructures. So zoomed in on one pixel in particular, you can see a color change at 10 volts where you have a green and you have a more of a tan beige color at 120 volts. 
Now this is less than what we simulated. We suspect because we are not getting the full reorientation. The theoretical orientations for 1.5 and 1.7 are perpendicular and parallel. However, we suspect that because of the AC field that we're applying, we're not getting complete reorientations. Uh, however, you can see on the diagram to the right that it's not just an on-off phenomenon. We actually get a very smooth gradient depending on the voltage that we apply. And there's virtually no hysteresis between increasing the voltage and decreasing the voltage, which tells us that the colors that we produce are solely dependent on the voltage. Uh, moving on. And just here's a video of the color change. So it starts off green with no voltage. And then at 100 volts, it's more of a tan color. You can notice that at lower voltages, like right here, you have a lot of grain boundaries. This is because the, grain, the liquid crystals align themselves to the surrounding topology. So that includes the gold and the ITO. But once we apply a sufficiently small voltage, usually or su sufficiently large voltage, approximately 20 volts, the electric field is strong enough to reorient them into a single orientation. Uh, next is the power consumption. So as you can see, there, our device does use relatively small power, 5 milliwatts at the highest voltage that we tested, which is lower than what typical displays use, especially those with backlights. Um, and what we found is that the, the power that we are using is proportional to the distance between the electrodes because we're applying the electric field. So we don't have, we didn't have perfect fabrication methods for actually creating spacers to prevent the ITO and the substrate from touching each other. We need a gap for the liquid crystal. But as Naveed was saying, this phenomenon is very sensitive at the interface of the gold. So if we have more higher, if we have more complicated manufacturing methods to actually reduce the size of the spacer, we can decrease the size and thus the power by up to 100 times. Uh, and finally, the, or one of the other things we tested was the refresh rate. So how quickly can we change the color when we change the voltage? So as you can see from the diagram, we have a snapshot of one of the videos that we took. So this is a three second snapshot where we had voltage off and then we suddenly went to 120 volts. Now as you can see, we got a switching time of approximately 0.3 seconds. Now we feel that this is an inaccurate representation and that is because our source for changing the voltage uses a dial and we had to manually turn the dial in order to change the voltage. If we had a voltage source that could instantaneously change the voltage, we feel that this switching time would be significantly smaller than it is now. One of the things we mentioned was how, when we did simulations, we looked at what different periodicities and space sizes of circles and squares we can look at to improve our design. But there is a significant amount of room for experimentation with different structures, different spacings. There's also different plasmonic materials we can use. We don't necessarily have to use gold. We can also experiment with things like silver. We can, other, we can look into other index changing methods. So rather than just using liquid crystals, we can also use phase change materials. When you apply a pressure, they change uh, refractive index. As I said before, we can use thinner spacers to greatly reduce the power consumption that we already have. And also, we can introduce disorder into the lattice that already exists. So right now, as you can see here and in our structure, there are specific lattices for how the nanostructures are arranged. But this introduces some angle dependence. So by introducing pseudo-randomness into the lattice, we can reduce that, that angle dependence. And also, lastly, we did talk about scalability. How feasible is this for large-scale production? Well, the structures that we've designed are actually highly compatible with a lot of high-throughput nanofabrication methods. So for prototyping's sake, we were just using e-beam lithography. But the structures are actually compatible with high-throughput techniques like UV photolithography, laser interference lithography, and roll-to-roll nano, -roll nano-imprint lithography, which you can see a diagram of on the bottom. It's very simplistic. And that's the conclusion of our presentation. So if you have any questions, Naveed and Nigel will kindly answer them.
already mentioned the unique of all of the options. Uh, how small is that growing? Yeah, so we were, yeah, we were looking at fabricating um, a large-scale prototype for the symposium. So I was actually in contact with a company in Germany called Temicon, who fabricates uh, large area structures. Um, and so all the designs that I gave them went down to about 250 nanometers, and they said that they could fabricate those for us with UV methods. So 250 nanometers is real? Yeah, so all of our structures were actually close to around 300 nanometers. Yeah. 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 So the different sizes tune the initial color. So by controlling the pitch and the width, you can change what color it starts from. And then when you change the refractive index by changing the liquid crystal, you can then shift the color. So the plasmonic absorption depends on the size of those, uh, of those um, gold gratings. When you change that, the, the, the frequency at which absorbs, absorbance happens depends on the sizes. So when you change the size, the, the, absorb, the absorption dip um, I find it that that shifts along the frequency, and then you get a different reflected color. I see. And then the liquid crystal basically changes the image. That's right. So so the color depends both on the size of those structures and also the refractive index of the surrounding medium. We we want to keep the uh, the sizes constant and change the refractive index. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.